Hey guys, IT guy Michael here and welcome to another lecture of our course for classification in Python. In this lecture we're gonna talk about how to evaluate the classifier. Right, we didn't I didn't show you any classifier or I didn't explain you some of the classifiers in the Python. But before we move to classifier classification and uh, running the classification, we need to understand how we're gonna evaluate it. Trust me, this is much better to start with than going there later. So uh, if you look inside this uh, notebook over here, you can see that I'm importing here a lot of stuff. Uh, for the purpose of example, I'm going to use something which is called K nearest neighbors classifier in this, in this notebook. I will later explain how this classifier work. Right now, you can think of a classifier as a black box. You put inside there uh, the parameters or the features of the, let's say in this case, a given employee like what's his age, what's his gender, how many years is, it, is he working there, what was the, how long is he under this manager, hey, yes, and, and stuff like this. And then the black box will say whether this guy will leave the company or not. So, and now uh, let's talk about how we can evaluate the classifier, right? So, so before we, mm, we move next, let's just, uh, let's just think about, right? Let's say you want to predict 10 uh, employees, okay? So, so 10, uh, you want to know uh, about 10 employees if they will stay or if they will go. You will put an array with uh, 10 uh, features uh, for each of the employee inside the black box and the classifier will output uh, an array like 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 right? So he's saying that the first five of the uh, employees in the feature vector will uh, leave the company, while the last five, least five, will stay at the company, right? And now, let's say you know the truth, right? You somehow have the magic ball and, and after a few months, you will find the truth, like one, zero, one, one, one. Uh, one, zero, one, oh, sorry, zero, zero, zero. So, so this is the truth. And now in the machine learning, uh, there are uh, ways how you can evaluate the accuracy or, or the performance of the classifier, right? Forget about the accuracy right now, okay? So, so first of all, yeah, the, the basic thing is like mm, computing how many times does the classifier hit, that's the accuracy. So if there were like 10 uh, like possible examples, out of 10 examples, he took like how many of them? Eight, right? So it's 80% accuracy, right? Eight of 10, he was right, so it's 80%. But now there are more sophisticated approaches to evaluate the classifiers, which I want to tell you right now. So let's imagine uh, what are the cases that can happen. So in this case, these, in, in this matrix or in this table, we have at the left side, the actual class. So what was the real value of the prediction? So this means uh, in these rows, we will have cases when the actual class was zero. And here we have cases where the actual class was one. And in the columns, we will have predictions. So when the prediction was zero and when the prediction was one. So for this case, when the prediction was that he will stay and the prediction is that it, he will or she will go, right? So for the matrix, the cell is called a true negative. That means that we were predicting about something that will not happen. And in truth, it didn't happen. So we were right and it was true negative prediction. In this case, we were saying it will be positive, but in reality, it was false. That's the reason why it's called a false positive example. And now in this case, we have a false negative because we were predicting it was false. Uh, and, and basically we were false because it was true. So it was a false negative. And here we have true positive because we predicted it's a positive and basically it was a positive. So when we go back to these two arrays, uh, this is our prediction. And this is the reality. I will just align it one after another. So this is a true positive example. This is what we are predicting that it's true. So it's a false positive because the reality was zero, right? It's a false positive. If you look here, uh, it's a prediction was one. And then this is a true positive, true positive, true positive. This is a false negative. This is a true negative, true negative, true negative, true negative, right? Simple. 
Now, what's next? Having these like counts for these, we can evaluate the accuracy, which I showed you right now. We compute the true positive plus true negatives, right? So that's eight, and we, we divide it by each of that, right? The sum of everything, right? That's what I did in the first case, that's 80%. Now, but there is something which is called precision and recall, and this can be much more descriptive for our cases. Now, precision is the number of true positives out of true positive plus true negative. If you look in the table, the true positives is here. So that's the number of times when we hit the prediction, the true, and it was true. And the true negative is here. So that's the number of time when the prediction was negative and it was negative. So basically precision is saying, when we predict something and and so so how many of of uh, sorry one more time the precision has in the denominator the true positive plus false positive so if you look in the table is true positive and false positive so we are talking about the cases when we predict that something is happening right that something was positive and basically the precision says the, that's the number or the percentage out of our predictions. So how many of our positive predictions are actually true, right? Give it a pause and think about it. Because in the denominator is true positive plus false positive. That are the cases when we are predicting that something happens. Is that what's the probability that we are right in case when we are saying that something is happening, right? And then there is something which is called recall. And if you call, uh, if you look at the recalls and denominator, there is a true positive that's here, and there is a false negative. False negative. So basically, recalls is saying how many of actual positive cases are we hitting with our classifier? Yes, because this is a true positive. So how many of them are we hitting? Now there is something which is called. Uh, uh, so 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 there is. Uh, uh, something for something law. So wh while we are trying to optimize the precision, many times we are lowering the recall. So you need to find the balance between the precision and recall, right? And sometimes it's, it's we have a very high precisions. So if you look here, the less we predict something that it is true, the less chance it is that we are false, yeah, that we are not right. So, so basically, as you can see, this is uh, quite a trade-off. Now, many of you can be confused right now. Ah, we are losing here and, and we don't understand this. Give it a pause and go through it again. Now, there is some one more descriptive measure, which is a very uh, like hard to understand because it's a lot mathematical compared to the precision and recall, which I explained you here by words. And it's called, F F1, it's called an F1 measure. Now, in this case, the F1 measure is just a combination of precision and recall. And here you can see the, the formula for this. And F1 measure is just one number saying something about the classifier accuracy or classi sorry, classifier performance, right? So you can think as a, a F1 measure as some ground truth, uh, which can be used anytime. But many times I, as a professional machine learning engineer, I like to look at the precision recall values then to the F1 measure. Now, uh, you can see that we are talking about hitting. Now, hitting a class. Now, uh, it's it's quite simple for binary classification, but it comes quite trickier when you are like talking about multiple classes. Let's forget about something, uh, uh, forget about classes like true and false. Think about classes like A and B, right? So. Uh, the precision for A will be like how many times are we hitting A when we are saying that something is A. And when we want to compute the precision uh, for the model in general, we need to compute the precision for class A and for class B, right? And if we have N classes, we need to compute for each of these N classes, right? So it's quite simple to compute it for one class, but it's harder to combine it for multiple class. And in this case, we are talking about macro precision and micro precision. And these are the ways how we can combine the precision for each class. And basically the macro precision is just the average of precision for each class, while the micro precision is something else, something more complicated. Uh, in micro precision, we are just computing the true positive for each of the class divided by true positive for each of the class plus some of the false positive for each of the class, right? 
It can be quite complicated. I don't want to go into too much details and bore you. If you are interested in micro and ma macro precision, go to the internet right now for the purpose of, of uh, binary classification. It's much easier to work with the, with the macro precision because it's like the same, the micro and micro for the binary classification. Whew. So now that was a lot of information about precision and recall. So what we want to do? So it's a good practice that after the exploratory analysis, you just go take the data and make a first classifier just for numerical data and see how it goes, how it well behaves, right? So if you remember in the previous exploratory analysis uh, uh, notebook at the end, I saved the numerical data to a file called process data slash numerical CSV. So here I can immediately read it. And now I can, I know that in this DF, I have only numerical data with the target value. So if you look at the columns, there is the age, distance, and at the end we have the attrition number, right? So this is amazing. So right now we can make a simple prediction just on the numerical data. And running the first prediction is as simple as this. First of all, it's good to split the data frame into the features and the predicted or the target value. In this case, the target value is attrition number, while the X, the features, I will refer to X with capital X to a matrix, while I will refer with the lower uh, case uh, letters to a vector. What does it mean? This is a vector, right? And this is a matrix with multiple rows and columns. So here I'm saying I want each column except these two columns. And here I'm saying for the Y, I want just these columns, right? So if you look inside here, by running these, oh, I need to run everything at the start. Yeah, we can ignore this one. And here, by running these, you can see that we have 3,677 cases where the attrition is equal to zero and 705 uh, cases when the attrition is equal to one. And now what we want to do is we are going to split the data set into training sample and test sample. And what is this? So uh, in order to evaluate a data set, we want to test the performance in order to evaluate the classifier. We want to test the performance of the classifier on the data, which was not presented during the training of the classifier, right? So when you have a labeled data set, as in this case we have, we want to split some part to training and some part to, uh, to actually testing and evaluation, right? And it's a good rule of thumb, uh, which is called 80 to 20, where we are saying that 80% of the data set is set to training while 20% of the data set is set to evaluation, right? And uh, Python uh, and uh, scikit-learn allows us to run this train test split, which is a, a function from the, from the uh, scikit-learn to split the, this data set for us. And by running this, it will just equally split uh, the data set to train and test. And here you can see that it automatically split uh, the, the positive and negative cases according to the rule and also it did for the training set, right? So you don't need to worry about writing a function to split the train and test set and to keep the equal number of these and these, yes? Also the, the, the data set is being shuffled so, so you don't need to worry about this thing, right? And now that we have the train x train and x sorry, X train and Y train will be used for training, while X test and Y test will be used for evaluation to compute this precision recall F1 measures, right? And accuracy. Now, so how, how, do, we, how do we run a classifier? Yes, so in order to create a classifier, you need to create an instance of the classifier. Let's say for this case, it's just a black box for you, I understand, so just follow the steps. So here we are saying into the variable Nate, we are setting it to uh, the instance of the k nearest neighbors classifier for the n neighbors, which is a variable set to three. Don't need to think about it right now. And then we are training a classifier. So we are saying Nate fit with X train and Y train. The fit is the method which will be used for every machine learning model you will met in your life. When you create some, uh, some machine learning model on your own, always provide the fit and fit transform and, and predict 
functions for, for, for the others. So as you can see, here we are training the classifier and by running this, the nate variable will be in placely updated. So you don't need to assign it to another variable. And then we can predict, now we are predicting how many of the test uh, set employees will go in the future, right? So by running this, you will see that inside the y predict, we will have an array of ones and zeros, right? And this is the prediction array from the beginning, right? We can compare now this prediction array with the y test, which is the actually the truth of the predictions for the given employees, right? So in the next cell, I can compute the F1 score for the Y test Y print and average micro, whatever, don't care about this. And then we can also compute the precision score, recall score for macro. So by running this, you will see that we are having pretty nice results. Even the baseline classifier got 92% for F1 score and precision score 84. Now, there is a classification report, which is a function which can provide more insights. So here you can see that for the class zero, so for the class when we are saying that the guys will not leave the company, we are reaching the precision of 96%. So out of the all existing uh, examples for the class zero, we are reaching to 96% of them. And when we are saying, uh, so that this is 96, and when we are saying that somebody will uh, stay at the company and we are labeling it as a zero, we are, the, we are accurate on 96%, right? And here you can see on how many classes it was predicted. Here is also F score for these guys. And there you can see other uh, measures down there. The most important part of this table is this precision recall for each of these values and F score, right? You can even plot the confusion metrics. And here you can see, this is a true. So true positive, we have 89 cases. True negative, we have 722, right? But we have troubles in these two regions. So in... And, and now for you, what do you think? Which of these two numbers is more critical for us? And the answer is, is this one. Why? Because there is less, uh, uh, sorry, this one. There is less uh, like true labels. So, the lab so there is less examples when the, uh, when the employees will leave. And so, so this number is relatively bigger to this number than this number to this number, right? So our biggest problem is this uh, false negative, which is quite big. So we want to minimize this in the next videos now. Okay, this could be quite confusing. It took me a lot of energy to explain this. I hope this was not confusing. It's still confu If it's still confusing, please leave a comment in the discussion below. I will make my best to give you some other resources to explain this issue like properly because this is the essential part and without this part you are unable to continue with the next lectures. Okay guys, thank you very much for watching this video. I hope I will see you in the next, next lecture of this course.